Good morning. Welcome to the PME 360 Powering Business Growth Show, where each session we discuss proven ways with our industry experts to help power growth for your remodeling business. Our guests have proven themselves within their niche and are the leaders in their space. Listen in as our experts provide practical tips that you can immediately apply to help power growth for your small to mid-sized remodeling business. I'm your host, Ron Rohde, Jr. Joining me today, as always, is the great Ryan Paul Adams. As the founder and CEO of PME360, Ryan and his team have helped power growth online for small and medium-sized businesses with a focus on the remodeling and home improvement space. PME360 provides effective and affordable, guaranteed, complete marketing systems that power growth quickly. Ryan has developed several companies, online and offline, and has helped generate millions in millions in revenue for local businesses over the past eight years. Entrepreneur, author, founder of PME360, founder of RyanPaulAdams.com. Ryan, good morning. Ryan Paul Adams, how are you? Good morning. Thank you, Ron, for the intro. That was You're welcome. Well done, as always. My pleasure. I uh, we'll we'll get it we'll get it to the point where we're not smiling as we yeah as exactly. We get one of these yeah, days. I have to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> also very excited to have on with us today Melanie Hodgden. Melanie is author and speaker and trainer. She is very well accomplished. She works with clients to identify financial and procedural challenges and to generate realistic solutions that reflect the resources and style of their companies. Applying a blend of logic, logic insight and experience with scores of remodeling companies she creates company-specific solutions to help contractors operate more profitably. Author of A Simple Guide to Turning a Profit as a Contractor, she has been her client's easy button since 1994. Please welcome Melanie Hodgson. Melanie, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Ron. Thanks so much for that intro. I'm well and looking forward to our session. Good morning, Melanie. Hi, Ryan. Very, ex very excited to have you on. Today's topic is understanding the true cost of field labor and how it can kill profit. And I know, Melanie, this is something that you've spoken about um, in the past and something that certainly I know will bring a lot of value here to our audience. So whenever you're ready, please feel free to go ahead and get started, and we'll listen in attentively and provide some feedback where necessary. Thanks so much. We're off and running. The agenda today is to talk about the strategy, what burdened labor is, productivity and efficiency and how it affects that, crunching the numbers, and finally doing something about the numbers once you understand them better. WSIC, why should I care? Why is it important to actually understand what your labor costs? Well, when you're estimating a job, presumably you are putting together numbers some of the numbers are easy, some of the numbers are harder to put together. If you get a bid from or a quote from a sub, that's pretty easy. If your electrician says it's going to be $23,000, that's easy. That goes into your estimate as a cost. Materials, you can do your takeoff, send it to the lumber yard, get a quote, same thing. Labor is the hardest thing to estimate. And you really have a lot of uncertainties. And that's where most contractors' slippage occurs is in the area of the estimate. So if you're not estimating using the actual costs, if you're underestimating that, then you can wind up with a price that is also too low. So if your strategy is to take your cost, add a markup, and then come up with a price, then whether or not you are contract price or TNM, it really doesn't matter. Either way, you're going to be taking costs, adding something to it, and then coming up with a price. And if your assumptions regarding costs are off, then your price will be off. When you're job costing, you also need to have uh, the ability to see what your actual labor costs are as those hours start accruing. And if you are not doing that using the correct numbers, that can give you a false sense of profit. So when you analyze your numbers, you'll actually be inaccurate. You'll be thinking the job is more profitable than it is. And that means that when you come to revise your estimating process, you may not pick up on that. And you will continue to reproduce this cycle of errors. 
So the strategy, first of all, let's identify the challenges. Labor is the hardest piece to estimate. How long will it take? How much will it cost? For example, if you have a job that you think is going to be about one-third, one-third, one-third subs labor and materials, and in fact, it's actually looking more like this, then once again, you're going to be, if you're pricing for a circle, then everything beyond the perimeter of what you think the labor is costing you is going to be left on the table or will come out to be a loss. So identify what you can. If you estimate in units of time, hours, days, man days, I have been asked by people when I produce estimates for them or when I, excuse me, when I produce estimating tools for them. Some want it by hours, some want it by days, somebody want it by man days, crew days. There's all sorts of ways that people want to see and, and think through the process of estimating a project. But whatever it is, you need to identify the actual cost per unit, whether it's a unit of crew days of three guys or a unit of hours. And that is necessary in order to come up with a realistic cost for your labor. So that's the strategy. Now let's take a look at the burdens themselves. We have a, a picture here of Pigpen, the popular character from uh, the Charlie Brown uh, Peanuts comic strip. And I bring in Pigpen not because your guys are dirty, but rather because Pigpen is known for the fact that he is surrounded by this cloud of dirt and filth and dust. And wherever he goes, this little cloud surrounds him. And that little cloud, I'd like you to think of all of the costs that are associated with your guys. When they are on the job site, they are surrounded by a bunch of costs. And they move wherever the guys move. And some of them move with the guy even when he's not at your job site working for you. So we'll talk about that. We're going to start out with wages. That's the easy one. What are you paying in per hour? Then we're going to add mandatory, voluntary, and associated costs and look at what each of those comprises. Well, let's start with wages. So we look at the wages. It's a big red box here. Hourly is easy. If you have a salaried production worker, you can divide the annual amount by the estimated paid number of hours per year. This can get tricky. If you have an hourly guy, then basically you are paying him whatever it is, $15 an hour, $20 an hour, whatever that amount is, it becomes very easy. If you're paying him $10 an hour to keep the math simple and he works 40 hours, then you're paying him $400. If he works 38 hours, it's $380. Very simple. With salary, it's a little bit more challenging because you are giving him the same amount each pay period, but he might be working a variety of hours. So that's a little more challenging. And when possible, I like to see all production workers on annual simply because the math works better and the job costing works better. To that, you're going to add mandatory costs. Mandatory costs consists of things like payroll taxes, workers' comp, liability insurance. You have no say over this. It is imposed on you. So that adds our blue box. Then we have voluntary costs. Now, depending on your company, you may have one or more of these. You may have other things. You may be offering health insurance. Incidentally, if you are offering health insurance, my suggestion is that you do not, in your employee manual, say that you are going to be providing health insurance full boat for the uh, employee. Instead, give a dollar figure. This way, when your insurance doubles, as it did recently for right. uh, an acquaintance of mine, then you're going to be tied into a dollar amount rather than having to suddenly jump and pay that. Dental, retirement, bonus, it's whatever these other costs are that you um, give to your employees. Some people, uh, some companies offer other little perks. Uh, one company I know offers a membership to each of its um, uh, employees at the local health club. Another one provides subscriptions for trade magazines to its production workers, hoping that they're going to be doing a little reading and self-education. So these are all your voluntary costs in the yellow box. What else? Well, there's associated costs. These are things that quite often you don't think about when you have in your head what it costs you to put a guy in the field. But if he's driving your truck, 
or if he's got your cell phone, or if he is driving his own truck but you are compensating him with a mileage reimbursement each pay period, then you've got to consider that to be a cost. Same thing with communications. If somebody has got a cell phone that they are using but they are not using a particular plan and you need them to, then you have got to consider that cost as well. And of course, training and education. And I have to break for just one moment, please. I have to put you on mute. OK, no problem. I apologize for that. There was a noise in the office, and I had to take care of it. That's OK. Let's continue. So now we've got a pretty tall column here of wages, mandatory, voluntary, and associated costs. And let's take a look at what it takes to calculate it. We have got fixed and hourly costs. So fixed and hourly, if you pay Jim for an hour, you need to pay the wages plus the taxes and the workers' comp for that hour because wages and workers' comp are tied directly to the number of hours that are worked. The second one is fixed and annual. You pay health insurance whether or not you're paying Jim or not. That's why I said um, when your employee is not necessarily working on a project, he could be on a vacation in Aruba, but you are still covering him for health insurance. And then you have got estimated costs based on history. And this is where if you've got good numbers for what it costs you to put that guy's vehicle um, on the road for a uh, year, then you can get that as an estimated cost based on those historical figures. Same with communications. What are you paying per month for any cell phone costs that are associated with the employee? Now, if you're lucky and you have got an employee who is using his own truck just for the heck of it and not charging or expecting any kind of compensation, then for heaven's sake, keep him because he's saving you a lot of money. <laughs> right, right. Same thing with uh, if you've got a you know, 20 or 30-something, I'm going to show my age here, who is all about getting the latest smartphone and delights in using it and paying for it on its own. Yippee, keep, get more of that. So, we have two options for calculating. One is you take up the total cost per year, and then you divide by the total number of hours, and you get a per hour cost. So if the total cost is this big red box here, then we divide by hours to get this little green box, which represents the cost per hour. The other way to do it is to convert everything to a cost per hour, these little tiny red boxes. And then that, when you add them all up, should be the same. So you should be able to go either way. My preference is to use the first option simply because it's easier to look at annual costs for some of these things like vehicles and even health insurance. Sure. So now let's take a look at productivity and efficiency. What does that have to do with burden? Hmm. Well, is your employee's time 100% billable? In some cases, it may be. There are some service businesses that do nothing but service calls. And as a consumer, I'm sure you can appreciate the fact that when somebody comes in with a truck to fix the toilet which is gushing in your bathroom, you are going to be paying for the entire experience from the time that he leaves the shop to the time that he gets back to the shop and your toilet has quieted down. So uh, you're really not necessarily seeing the cost of the travel in there, but um, if it's a, a reputable company that's been around for a while, the only way they can survive is to push that right into the bill so the consumer is covering it. But for many remodelers, or even most remodelers, your employee's time is not 100% billable. And does that matter in terms of what it costs you to put that guy in the field? Well, let's do the math. So let's say that your cost per hour was magically jumped ahead and discovered that our employee is costing us $31.25 per hour. He might be costing you somewhere around $22, $23 by the time you put on all the taxes and all of the other burdens. It winds up being $31.25 per hour. If we have, um, if we have paid hours of $2,080, 
And the, re the way that I got that was eight hours per day times five days per week times 52 weeks per year. And that comes out to 2,080. So the total cost then is $65,000. So let's take a look then at what it would be for the billable hours. Let's say that you're paying him for a couple of weeks of vacation, you're taking him to a trade show for training, you're sending him out for training, you have Monday morning production meetings where he's not out in the field doing production work. You have got those couple of times a year when some expert comes in to, from OSHA to show you how to wear a respirator properly or to talk about a new health insurance or retirement plan. So your billable hours, if you're lucky, are going to be down more like 1875 So if we take that whole 3125 and we multiply it by the billable hours per year, which is what you'd like to really pay him. Wouldn't you really like to be paying him for only what right. he is um, there to, to be charged out for? Then your total per year is only 58 .5, which means that you spend an additional $6,400 for this guy when you really only got out from him the equivalent of the 58. Hmm. So productivity and efficiency does tie into how the costs work. So Melanie, so, the, what, yeah. just a quick question on that slide. So the that that's running about 10% non-billable hours. Is that like a good rule of thumb for most people? To use? <laughs> I know I hate like because every business is going to be different, but like you right. run into like a consistent percentage of like paid hours versus actual billable. Um, that um, somebody not, quickly... I have not run the percentages, and you're absolutely right. It always varies. Okay. And uh, here's here are the parameters. Do you offer paid vacation? Right. Yes or no. Do you offer paid holidays? Yes or no. And for some companies, you may be looking at a 12-year employee for whom you are giving uh, to whom you are giving two weeks of vacation time. So that can affect it. The other thing that can affect it is whether or not uh, the whole model of your business. If you are a, a remodeler with very, very small projects, almost bordering on the handyman, right. then what's going to happen is your guy might be doing two jobs in a day. So yep. we're talking travel, set up, breakdown, um, all of that. Do you, for example, uh, require the guys to check in to the office in the morning? Or can they, if they're living by chance next door to the job site, is it okay for them to just walk next door and start work? So all of these are parameters. Makes sense. Yeah, I was just curious if you run into a number so that, that it's really hard. I, I can see that. Yeah, I've seen numbers everywhere down to about in the high 70% efficiency, all the way up to companies with virtually, um, how can I say this, they, they are charging for travel time and possibly they don't have any benefits, then they can get up around you know, 98, 99%. Gotcha, yeah. Depends on the model. Right. Well, thank you. Sure. All right. So now let's take a look at pro uh, productivity and efficiency identified. What contributes to it? Holiday sick, education, meetings, uncharged travel time, customer face time. You know, when Mrs. Homeowner comes out to greet the boys with a hot apple pie and some nice freshly brewed coffee, what are they going to do? Say, no, thank you. I'd rather stay here in a pit of sawdust and um, keep on working in 90 degree heat. Oh, maybe it's iced tea if they're in 90 degree heat. But at any rate, right. that is going to be time that is lost. And if it's not Mrs. Homeowner coming out with the baked cookies, then it might be Mr. Homeowner coming out and asking questions. Sure. Um, that, that just chews up time. And remodeling, as with any other service business, and it is a service business. You may think it's a construction business. It's not. It's a service business. You are meeting somebody's needs. That's a service. Absolutely. And it's absolutely critical to keep uh, a good rapport with the homeowner. So when they come out, then uh, you need to pay attention to them. And the other required company tasks, 
how many companies require their guys to clean out the trucks or at least maintain them properly. They may even have a washing station where the trucks are kept clean. If you've got an older truck that is well maintained and clean, it's going to look better than a brand new flashy truck covered with crud. Then you've got other types of paperwork tasks to do, or in this day and age, transmission of timesheet data, for example. So all of these take up time away from that productivity. And productivity, I'd like to just define here for a moment as an aside. Productivity would be the time during which the employees are engaged in the tasks which are included in the estimate. So if you have estimated time for installing windows, if the guy is installing windows, then he is engaging in productive time. Melanie, can you say that again? That's, that's critically important. Can you okay. define that again, please? Sure. So productivity or productive time for a production worker would be that time during which he is performing tasks that were included in the estimate. Right. Yep. So if he is um, putting down roof sheathing, then if that's in the estimate, then that is exactly productive time. It does not, and if it does not fall within the original estimate, that's where additional costs come in that are critically important that allow you to not be as efficient, correct? That's really what you're saying. Well, there are, there are two types of tasks that can kind of interrupt that flow. One is if, um, let's say that somebody, part of the task is to uh, frame out, let's say we've got a two-story addition and we're framing out the master bedroom expansion. So there was an old, um, nasty, nasty master bedroom upstairs that now put on a two-story addition and now we have got a, uh, a situation in which we're blowing out the walls, the exterior walls from the old master bedroom and uh, going to expand into this new, newly created space. So they have got a job which is framing for the new closets in the new space. And they are engaged in that. That is part of the estimate, and they are doing yeah. that. Yeah. And then Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner come in and they go, oh my, we didn't realize this space was going to be so large. Well, if we've got that much space, I'd really like a larger walk-in closet. Sure. Now that becomes a change order. And that change order then becomes part of the contractual agreement, but it's like a little sub-job. And that then, any work in tearing out the framing that guess what they already put in, and replacing it with a framing for a different size closet in a different location perhaps, that becomes all productive work under the change order uh, subcontract, we'll call it, or a, a, it. an addendum to the, co uh, to the con contract. But when Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner come in and take up time by showing them the pictures of the new grandbaby that was just born, or sure. offering them snacks or treats, or talking about the philosophy of construction, and waste time, then that is non-productive time. Is that yep. distinction clearer? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Very good. Okay, so how do we calculate that? What's productive time? Anything included in the estimate? And if it's in the estimate, and that would include a change order, uh, all change orders, if you're on contract price, should be incorporated into the estimate. Otherwise, your costs, your estimated costs will not follow the actual progress of the job. And then, of course, anything that is chargeable. If it's in the estimate, if it's in the agreement, then logically it's chargeable. So if a guy is standing there engaged in some sort of task, he should ask himself, is what I am doing chargeable? If so, then it is productive. If not, then it is not productive unless, and I'm going to stick in an unless here, and unless in certain circumstances, particularly with things like a lead carpenter system, and this is really important to look at, a lead carpenter system says that the duty of the lead is to not only perform the work with the assistance of a helper, but also to act as an administrator of that job. 
that means that he is going to be responsible for any conversations with the homeowner that are related to change work. Um, he is going to be dealing with the subs. He is going to be receiving and checking in materials. He is going to be acting as like a project supervisor as well as the project implementer. In that kind of situation, during the estimating process, you've really got two things to estimate for. One component is the productive time, and that is the time that in this case, in this lead carpenter example that I'm using, that the lead carpenter is actually engaged in nail banging sawdust making activities, which are part of the estimated scope of work. The other consideration is you know in advance that that lead is going to be engaged in quote-unquote non-productive but essential activity related to that job, such as writing up change orders, receiving payments, and uh, dealing with subs. And in that case, during the estimating process, you would need to be able to put in an allowance of hours for that so that the time on the lead carpenter is going to be expanded based on historical records of the proportion of time that the lead is engaged in these non-quote-unquote productive tasks. So for example, if you are recording your time in a way that allows you to capture that information, and you discover that out of a thousand hours of paid work from the lead carpenter, and let's for now assume he is 100% efficiency so we can keep the numbers easy. So you paid him for a thousand hours. If by looking at his timesheet information, you discover that 300 hours were performing lead carpenter administrative activities and 70 hours were for producing the actual work, then what you know is 30% of his time is being spent on these administrative tasks. Right. And then you can add that in when you're calculating the labor costs for this employee, you can calculate that in and incorporate it into your estimating process. So in that case, anything that's chargeable on that lead would include both the time that he's making sawdust and banging nails and the time that he is engaged in those administrative tasks because they are covered within the estimate. Is that clear? It is. Makes perfect sense. Yep. Okay. So how do we calculate? You count up the paid hours, count up the non-productive time, subtract the uh, from the paid hours to get the productive hours. And how does this affect things? Well, let's take a look. We are looking at a little labor burden calcula calculator here. This is a free product that I'm happy to share with all the viewers of this um, podcast, uh, excuse me, webinar. And uh, it uh, is available. I have instructions at the end on how you can ask for it. So let's say we're starting out with this total paid hours per year. And again, the 2080 is assuming an eight-hour workday, a five-day work week, and a 52-week pay period. Number of paid holidays, notice I've put in red the day or the hours so that you can pay attention to that. So if you're paying six holidays a year or five sick vacation personal days per year, days for training and education, whatever else, then what we see is the total non-productive time per year in hours is that 294, and the total productive per hours per year is down to 1786. And if you check it out, um, six paid holidays, actually the number of legal holidays in the U.S. is 10. And that's only a week's vacation, the five days here. Training and education, if you take them to a show, if you go to the remodeling show or a JLC, Journal of Light Construction Live show, then that can easily be three days out of the work week. Uh, meetings. This is hours per week for a company meeting. This particular company, a fictitious company, is spending an hour and a half a week in production meetings where attendance is mandatory. And this other non-billable time, two hours per week for non-billable time, filling out the con car, gassing up the truck, washing the truck, organizing the tools, sorting materials um, for delivery, or if you have a staging site off, off of the delivery site, maybe you've ordered your cabinets 
uh, three weeks in advance and you have a warehouse where those are going to be stored off of the construction site because there's simply no room or because it's, uh, it's just safer in terms of perhaps there are security issues, then that's all kinds of time that is going to be spent by those employees, legitimate time, and yet non-productive time. So if we look at the total number of productive hours per year, which is 1786, and divide by the total paid hours, then we see that this particular employee is only 85.87% efficient. And it's not his fault. It's just the, that's the way it is. Any questions about that? Uh, it makes sense, definitely. Okay. Okay. Well, then, um, I'm going to take a quick look at that calculator live. I'm going to blow this up a bit so that you can see what's going on. And if we put in, for example, an hourly wage calculation uh, of $22.50 an hour, and we put in, here's our 2080, and here's our six. Um, let's even only give them three. Let's see how it changes five days, let's say that we don't even have training or education. Uh, let's say that we've only got a half hour per week for a meeting. And let's say, I think that it's impossible to think that it wouldn't be at least a half hour a week for non-billable time. And when we look at the numbers, these are just the crunching of the mandatory taxes and the other costs and so forth and so on. Voluntary costs, this one, they happen to do health insurance. That's 200 bucks a month. Dental is 100 bucks a month. Cell phone is 100 bucks a month. And then it comes out that when you start with 2250, and we look at the dashboard here, and I'll blow that up a little bit more so we can see it. At 2250 an hour, the total of all of the annual burdens costs, including the mandatory voluntary and additional costs, is 735. If we divide that by the total number of hours for which this employee was paid, we see that he is costing the company 35 36 per hour. But if we take that same total annual burden cost and we divide it by the productive hours, remember that's here when we subtract all of these weekly and daily times that they, he is required to be doing something else, then we see that he's costing thirty-seven forty-five an hour. So there's more than two dollars per hour difference when you start looking at productivity. That's amazing. See, yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's shocking, isn't it? Yeah, so I had a means, I had a client that I was talking with. Um, I think within the last month, and you know, they would be charging to the to their client between twenty five and thirty dollars an hour, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> "You might want to reconsider an employee minimum wage." Yeah, yeah losing money. So let's take a, well, one more, two more things. First is if the total paid hours is this, and the total productive hours is this, then we divide uh, one by the other, and we see that this guy has got a utilization or productive hour per paid per paid hour rate of 94, or an efficiency rate of 94.42%, which is very high. But again, we've been very, very chintzy on this. We've only given right. him three holidays. He's got a week's vacation, excuse me, vacation. And these figures are probably, um, let's just say, optimistic in terms of reality. And finally, here's sort of an optional thing that you can do. What is your markup as a percent? So if he's costing you this, the 37.45, let's say that you have a 50% markup that you apply across the board. We can do another whole casting on markup and margin and how to price a job. But if we add that 50% to the cost, the productive cost, then you should be charging that guy out at 56.17 per hour. Wow. If your markup is 42 percent, then 53. But you should not be charging, you know, 37. A lot of people have been told by their accountants, oh, you know, if you just add um, half again as much, you'll be fine. Right. I've heard, oh, just add, just double it and you'll be fine. Well, if you double it, you're at 45. Yeah, you're not fine. <laughs> and you're not fine. No. But let's see what that might be then it's not even a 30% markup if we play around with this. Oh, my word. Yeah, that's not going to cover 
much of yeah. anything. So you're at somewhere around a 20% markup. Yeah. So you're only marking up your cost by about 20% if, in this case, you double your rate. Right. That's a wake-up call to a lot of contractors. They have no idea. Melanie, you mentioned that this uh, labor burden calculator is something that uh, the, the listeners can get access to. This is something very helpful, and I think every CPA should have, uh, every CPA that works with remodeling contractors should have access to this because it's, uh, it's, it's shocking, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it is. I'm happy to share this. This is, this okay. is my very free good. labor burden calculator. It's called the PME 360 Free Labor Burden Calculator. And there's instructions at the end of the webinar on how to request that from me. Perfect. So let's go back to this. All right, so now we've got another burden. We thought that the tower was pretty tall before, but now we are adding on a productivity component as well. And the cost of the non-productive time is another burden. It is something that the company has got to allow for. And it can be calculated, as we just saw. So now take a look at crunching the numbers, crunching the numbers. What you need to do in order to come up with that calculated burdened figure is you need to know the hourly wage, you need to know the rates for various payroll taxes, and that would be federal and state because state taxes vary by state and by company. So in the calculator, I've allowed you to put in the rates that are appropriate for your particular state. Your workers' comp rate, your liability, to get liability, all you do is take your annual cost of liability insurance, take a 12-month period if your liability is not a calendar year, just take that 12-month period, divide by your annual payroll. That's going to give you a little percentage figure. Then your annual cost for benefits, vehicle, and so forth. Other costs relevant to your company, whatever that might be. And, of course, you're going to have to have a handle on non-productive time. How will you get a handle on non-productive time unless you have a strategy within your company that per provides for a distinction between productive and non-productive time. So if your timesheet says, what job did you work on, how many hours were you there, and that's it, then at the end of the year, it's going to look like that employee was 100% efficient. Whereas if you have got two categories minimally for time, productive time, non-productive time, then you can start to see this particular employee's ratios right in your time tracking uh, software. So we went to the calculator already, and I'm just going to skip right on past that to talk about using the numbers now that we've got it. What do we do with it? Use the same burden labor cost when estimating and job costing. So if you have estimated that the labor cost is, we'll make the numbers round to make it easy, um, $60 an hour, because maybe you're working with a, um, a very experienced Finnish carpenter who's with, been with your company for 15 years, and maybe you're paying him $30 an hour then we need to look at keeping things apples to apples. So if this apple is the cost when you're estimating, then we want to have this same apple be the number that is used when you're job costing. Do not mix and match burdened and partially burdened figures. If you've got apples and oranges, you've got a salad. You do not have good numbers. So if this is your estimating figure and this is your job costing figure, you're probably going to be in trouble. And most of my clients are. They are being led down the rosy path by thinking they are more efficient, excuse me, more pr um, profitable on their labor than they actually are. So let's look at an example. Let's say that your burden cost is 60 an hour and you estimate 10 hours of work. Well, this is pretty easy. We have some task X. We estimate it's going to cost 10 or take 10 hours, and our calculated burden cost per hour is $60. Therefore, we estimate that the cost of the task will be $600. Easy peasy. 
Let's say that you are job costing using a partially burdened cost of 50 an hour. Well, why the heck would you do that? If you know it's 60, why would you be using a partially burdened, not a fully burdened cost of 50 an hour? Well, probably because you have absolutely no clue about how your software, your accounting software, whatever else you're using, if you're using a piece of canned software for accounting purposes as opposed to, we'll say, an Excel spreadsheet where you can control the numbers better, then it may be that your software is only allowing for $50 an hour. So let's assume that in your accounting software you're looking at a job cost report and we're looking at task X and we see that it costs you $550 an hour. That's great! We thought it was going to be $600 an hour. We are $50 under budget. Right. Yay! Or are we? If you are calculating, or if your software is calculating the burden cost at only $50 an hour, then in fact what has happened is that task cost you 11 hours. It took 11 hours. And now you're over your time budget by an hour. It was only supposed to be 10. They took 11. So you are actually 10% over your allocated time in terms of that particular task. Then, if it took you 11 and your burdened cost per hour is really 60, then the actual cost for the task is 660. So instead of being under by $50 from the estimated $600 task, you're actually over budget by $60 and over time by 10%. If you don't know you have an apples and oranges situation, will you continue to be misled? Well, yeah. <laughs> if you don't know that there's a problem, then you have no reason to try and fix it. So we've looked at using uh, the strategy, how to calculate the burden, how productivity and efficiency affects the burden calculation. We've looked at how to use the information about the cost to crunch the numbers and to come up with a reasonable figure, a calculated figure, per paid hour and per productive hour. And we've looked at how using the numbers correctly is going to be the only way that you will get good numbers in your estimating and your job cost analysis so that when you see that, go back to this, when you have, uh, are seeing that you achieved that task under time and under budget, next time would your tendency be to say, well, gosh, you know, if we did it in, in 10 hours, maybe we, could, maybe we could do it in 9 hours next time. Or, maybe I can fiddle the numbers and not allow as much cost for that. And that begins the death spiral downward, where you are underestimating the actual costs, you are believing erroneous figures, and then you are actually adjusting your estimating process to account for what you believe are accurate figures and are not. And that is where you start to perpetuate the error and, in fact, can even make it worse, which, of course, affects your profit. So, in summary, know what your excuse me, know what your labor costs you. Estimate and sell based on the cost. Job cost based on the same numbers. Constantly review and update. What happens, for example, when your workers' comp increases or your health insurance increases? Then, if you have not, as I suggested earlier in this session tied your health insurance coverage to a specific dollar value. If you've said, yeah, we'll cover you, we'll cover you, but not your wife and children, then, or, you know, or not your husband and children, then you are going to be stuck with escalating costs. So do whatever you can to minimize the potential for escalating labor costs by tying your, um, your benefits to dollar values. Be sure that if you have your workers' comp gets updated, that you go back to the calculator, put in the new numbers. And if you want a copy of the email, uh, excuse me, the labor written calculator, email me for it. My address is in the last slide. 
and it's simply put PME 363 labor burden calculator in the subject line when you email me, and I will send it back to you, and it will be in an Excel file. If you have an older version of Excel, please let me know. The current version that you just saw is in Excel 2010. If you have 10 or uh, higher than that, then you're fine. But if you have an earlier version, please stipulate the version, and I will save to that version and send it out to you. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic, Melanie. That was very helpful. Yeah, that was excellent. Melanie, do you find that most remodelers um, just kind of get too busy to pay attention to this stuff, and they're assuming that, oh, yeah. <laughs> assuming that the bookkeeper that they hired and the accountant that they hired, you know, they're the professionals that they'll just take care of it and tell them what they need to know? Absolutely true. Um, when, for example, when people are, when contractors are first starting to set up a file in accounting software, I happen to be a certified QuickBooks Pro advisor. It says right there on the screen. So I work a lot with contractors setting up QuickBooks. And what I often find, and I don't make my money setting up the people's files. Yeah. I make ninety percent of my money fixing what somebody else sure. fixed, uh, the did messes, set up that yeah. is wrong. And it's logical to assume that one's accountant is the best resource for setting up a file. However, what you have to consider is that even the best accountant in the world, unless they specialize in your industry, their finest, highest priority is going to be to produce a tax return for you as quickly as and accurately right, as possible. Right, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So they're going to structure your file to make it easy for them to file your taxes. And that's great for one day a year. That's exactly what you want. But for the other 364 days a year when you actually should be using your file as a management tool, then it's not very helpful if it's been set up for a different purpose. So um, what I suggest to people is that they go to an industry-specific expert when they are starting with their accounting software so that that can be structured for their needs. And it's things like what I already mentioned. Um, are you tracking time by productive and non-productive time? Well, why would anybody think about that unless they're looking ahead at a strategy in which that non-productive time is built into the estimate process? whether it's by putting in a burdened rate per productive hour as the base labor cost to which markup would be added, or whether we're looking at a lead carpenter system in which the lead's time is not being broken out so that we never get to see what proportion or percentage of time that he's being paid for, that he is actually uh, performing those administrative lead carpenter tasks. So it's, it's all... It's all about strategy, and I'm a strategist. I want to say, what do you, not what do you need today, or not what do you need to keep your accountant happy. I want to say, what numbers are you going to want to have a year from now so that you can constantly retune and zero in on what it is that you need to do to make your company as profitable as possible. And there's all sorts of things that need to be in place. If you don't think about it, then you will not have the answers. Yep. And a year from now when you say, geez, I wonder how many hours of blah, 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 if you haven't been tracking, it's gone. You have to wait another year or another six months before you can get that figure. And meanwhile, you are burdened, your calculated burdened rate per productive hour is going to be off to the tune of that productivity figure until you really nail it down. And, and one of the big takeaways, and I, I hope that everyone listening to this <clears throat> can can gather from this this webinar, and also recommend reading the book, is that, and I'm not picking on accountants, and I don't want it to come across like that, but they're not strategists, not the way that you think about this, and the way that someone like, you know, the way that we look at a business, it's just a different mindset. And like you said, their their job is to get you to get your taxes filed as quickly and efficiently as possible, but they're not really looking at 95% of the things that you're talking about to be more profitable and to make sure you're charging the right 
amount of money. And I've just, I've never come across an accountant that's ever looked at a remodeling business the way that you do. So it's really important to, to differentiate and distinguish that and make sure that you have somebody like yourself that can look at the strategy. Um, I, I just find it so important. Well, you don't ask your plumber to do wiring, and you right. don't ask your electrician to do drywall. And we all have specialty areas. We're all working on the house, you know, the, the plumber and the electrician, the drywall guy, they're all working on the same project, but they're members of a team. And the objective is to make sure that each part, each component of that project is done with the highest degree of professionalism. And I look at a company the same way. The production workers out in the field, they're part of the team. The strategists in terms of setting things up, the strategists and the analysts. Um, and that could be an in-house person. Right. Or it could be a, um, a chief financial officer. It could be uh, somebody who comes in monthly or quarterly and reviews the books from the standpoint of strategy, not tax preparation. Right. And of course, your tax preparer, your CPA, is a very important part of the team. But it doesn't mean that he should be cross-trained in analysis of the special needs of a remodeling company because a lot of these things don't really have to do with money directly. Right. How could any accountant necessarily think ahead and say, you should be structuring your timesheet to categorize the labor, the time that is being paid for, into compartments that will later allow you to get key numbers that will tie into your estimating process. That's not the way they think. Nope, it's, absolutely. Very helpful. Melanie, thanks so much again for preparing this and for joining us. We hope to have you on again sometime in the future. Ryan, thank you for your time and for the PME 360 Powering Business Growth Show. We will see you next time. Thank you, Melanie. Thank Appreciate you. it. My pleasure.